Um, welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. We are also excited to announce this week that all of our previous and upcoming recorded webinars will have Spanish subtitles, so please help spread the word. This is the 14th webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these weeks of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, that's N-O-A-A, -A, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Sean Dahl, who's a physical scientist with NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado. While we'll be talking about how NOAA does atmospheric research in Boulder, we want to recognize that these are the traditional territories of the regional Native Americans who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We recognize that the NOAA Boulder Laboratory sit upon land within the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. Further, there are 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We'd also like to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the land of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and want to make sure everyone can hear Sean. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I will be keeping track for Sean, and he'll stop every now and then and answer some. We may not get to all of your questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, Sean, we are ready for you. I will turn it over to you. All right, great, thanks, Nicole. Well, welcome everybody to what I hope to be a fantastic webinar on the sun, solar storms, and space weather. This is really interesting stuff, and a lot of people don't know much about the sun. We know it shines on us and gives us heat, but there's a lot of things going on that people are unaware of. So my goal here is to help you understand a lot about that and what that means for us here at planet Earth. But before I can rush into this like I want to, I was asked to share a little bit about myself. So here's the quick one minute version of, of how I got to be where I am. So I was born and raised in the state of North Dakota, when uh, where I really became interested in meteorology because of the crazy weather that always happened there. Uh, when I was about 13 years old, a total solar eclipse went right over my hometown and I got to see the entire thing. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen and it's stuck with me ever since. So I've really gained an interest in astronomy as well. Well, eventually when I graduated high school, I went on to college where I spent a couple of years but I never finished my original degree because a friend of mine uh, talked me from pursuing my science program I was in to uh, doing something different. So that different ended up being 22 years later when I retired from the United States Air Force. But while I was in the Air Force, I got to be an Air Force weather guy. And guess what? That's where I first learned about space weather and became involved in it. So 13 years ago, when I retired from the Air Force, I went on to work, uh, continued to do meteorology for the Air Force, but as a civilian, no longer in the uniform. From there, I joined the National Weather Service and took a job out in Hawaii. I don't know if anybody's on here from Hawaii, but if you are, aloha. And eventually, I found myself here five years ago in what I consider my dream job, which involves both weather and astronomy. How cool is that? So this is where I get to do space weather right here in, again, right here in Boulder, Colorado at the Space Weather Prediction Center, SWPC for short, because that's a long set of words. Now, the space weather community calls us SWPSI. We call ourselves SWPSI. You should call us SWPSI too. <laughs> now we fall under the National Weather Service as part of NOAA. And the mission of the National Weather Service is to protect lives and property. So that's what we do. I call it protecting livelihood. This picture you're seeing here is a picture of our forecast office from looking outside of a window. 
uh, there's two windows there, right? So you can see inside the forecast office. So in this picture, you're what we call outside the glass. And this is a big area. You can see some benches here. You can see um, display cases, some interesting objects and poster boards and monitors. That's because this area is set up for tours. Well, unfortunately, the way things are today and based off where you're at, not everybody can join us in person at the Space Weather Prediction Center. So I'm going to do the best I can to present this to you virtually today. So I'm going to start off with some questions to you. So we know the sun is big, but just how big do you think it is? We looked at the center disk of the sun. How many planet Earths do you think can fit across the center of the sun? What do you think? Okay, so Riley thinks it's B. Uh, we have a number of votes for C. Rebecca, Taylor, one, all think C. Um, let's see. Lots of C's coming in and, and B's. Um, let me see. That seems, we don't have any votes for, well, Nolan thinks it might be A. Um, but I seem to be getting a lot of C's. Okay. Uh, well, The bees have it, about 108 to 109 Earths, so 100 was the most correct. Now, that's big, right? So if you do the math and you know the size of Earth, you could figure out that roughly a million Earths could fit inside of the sun. So not only is it giant because 100 or more Earths could fit across the center of the sun, but it's enormous because a million Earths can fit inside of it. So I'm going to make your teachers angry at me, and I'm going to make a new word here. I like to call the sun ginormous. It's giant, it's enormous, let's call it what it is. So now that you know we have this ginormous sun and how big it actually is, let's think about how far away is it. So we know it's a long ways out there. What do you think? Thousands and thousands of miles, a million miles, or millions and millions of miles? Okay, let's open it up. Okay, so James, first out of the gate, says A. Well, we're getting B's and C's. Sophia thinks it's C. Um, I haven't, oh, let's see. Mason and Peter think it might be B. Um, wow, we're really divided on this. I'm getting a lot of a lot of mixture here. Nobody, nobody is confident. What do you think? All right. Well, good on you for making all those answers. And if you were answering A, dun dun dun. You are the most correct. It is almost 100 million miles away, a little over 93 million miles to be exact. So like this picture shows you, it's a long ways away, but the sun, remember, it's ginormous, right? If you could safely look at the sun, we know we can't, we'll go blind, right? But if you could, you know you see the moon every night in the sky, even though that's much closer perspectively, it's the same size in the sky as the sun. So that's still big, right? We can clearly see this disk, it's not a star, but it's so far away, it takes light a very long time to get here. Speed of light, it takes eight minutes for light coming from the sun to finally reach Earth. So the sun could vanish seven minutes ago and we wouldn't know it for another minute. How incredible is that? But even though it's so far away, it's hot and we feel it 93 million miles away. So if you think about a campfire, Right, like me and my snowman buddy here in Illinois. And you like to feel that heat, you get nice and close, and the further and further away you get, you know, the less you're gonna feel that heat from the fire. But if I took my snowman friend and we moved down to the sun, he wouldn't be very happy with me, would he? Because we know that we're gonna feel that heat. That's tremendous amounts of energy that you're feeling that makes you hot and sweaty on a nice summer day, 93 million miles away. That's the power of the sun. Now, when we have a space weather storm, that's increased energy coming from the sun. Now, we don't feel that as an increase in heat. It doesn't happen that way. But it does impact around our planet, and it can cause certain types of effects to happen. So space weather refers to the conditions that are happening on the sun, what's going on in space between us and the sun, planet Earth and the sun, and what that means for our planet. So what does space weather really look like? Like this. You don't get to see it this way, right? We just have it shining on us and that's mostly what people know. But we as forecasters at the SWPSI, 
we get to look at all this neat imagery of the sun. We get to look at fancy graphs and bars and data and information because we're looking for solar storms, which are kind of our versions of things that you do know, like blizzards and tornadoes, because they can affect our way of life. And with that said, we've talked about a little bit about the sun. We've talked about space weather. Uh, next thing we're going to talk about is effects. Time out for your some questions from you. What do you have to ask so far? Okay, guys, do you have any questions for Sean? Uh, normally, there are uh, a lot of uh, questions. So, so Ellie, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you know this answer, Sean, but uh, we'll try it. Do you know how far Mars is from the sun? I do not know the distance of Mars. I know it's well over 100 million miles away. Uh, but I don't know the exact distance. All right, so Ellie, you're gonna have to do a little research and get back to us on that so we can um, let Sean know. Uh, are there any other questions out there? Kyle would love to know, how hot is the sun? <laughs> the sun is funny, okay, because it's a nuclear furnace inside the sun that we can't see. So that's millions and millions of degrees. And then as you would expect, it gradually gets cooler as you go through other layers inside the sun. Hey, remember I said it takes eight minutes for light to get to Earth? Well, that's where light finally escapes from the sun. The sun is not a solid object like Earth, right? So it's kind of a giant ball of burning gas. So it doesn't have a surface, but we still call that layer where light escapes the surface. That temperature is right around 6,000 degrees. And then that's the coolest layer. Now, the funny thing is with the sun is it heats up again the further you go out from that layer. It heats up and pretty soon you're back to a million degrees. That's an oddity that we don't understand about the sun. So if you're interested in science, there is still a lot of things to learn about the sun. But for practical purposes, the surface of the sun, right around 6,000 degrees. Wow, I'm, I'm pretty impressed that you knew that. Okay, um, so how long, uh, James would love to know, in, in your introduction, you kind of went through your um, career, but. I think we need to do some math. He wants to know how long have you been doing this? I've been doing space weather here at SWPSI for five years now. Uh, the time I did it in the Air Force, you can add on another six years. So it's been uh, right around 11 to 12 years that I've been doing space weather work. Actual meteorology work, I've been doing closer to 30 years. Wow, that's great. Um, Ryan would like to know whether there are glasses you can use to look directly at the sun and not hurt your eyes? No, I would say no. There, during the solar eclipse, if you ever have a chance to watch one, you can buy what they call Mylar filtered glasses. Make sure they're the right ones, have your parents check, um, because then you can put those on and you can actually look at that photosphere. That's what that layer is that, we, that shines on us where light escapes. And that's what you can see uh, safely. But you really have to be careful, right? Because if they bend a little bit, your eye is exposed and it doesn't take but a split fraction of a second for you to go blind uh, looking at the sun, even trying to do it safely. So keep that in mind. Usually you wanna use a projection system to see that photosphere of the sun, or if you have a nice telescope system, there's really cool filters you can buy that you can look at the sun uh, quite safely as well. But that's what I would say. Okay, well, we have. I'm gonna throw one more at you before we get you back to your presentation. Um, how do we know what the temperature of the sun is? How is it measured? Uh, they generally figure it out based off wavelengths because we know wavelengths of light. There's something called, here's a fancy word for it, the electromagnetic spectrum. And there's different things that we know relate to temperatures based off chemicals and types of elements that things have. And so the short answer is by measuring certain types of wavelengths of energy, they can figure out what temperatures are without actually going there with a thermometer and figuring it out. Great. Um, I also want to let you know, Ellie got back to us. She did some research and found out that Mars is 135 million miles from the sun. Hey, so now that was Ellie? Yes. Thanks, Good Ellie. Good job, Ellie. All right, so we'll get back to it. I'll, I'll hold on to these other ones. Keep sending your questions in and I'll keep track of them for Sean to answer on the next break. All right, great. So, it's great questions, everybody. Keep them coming. I love answering them. So, let's move on. All right. So, 
you are outside the glass. That's what we call it when you're looking in through the windows on a tour at, our, at Swipsy. Now I'm bringing you into the forecast office. That's what this picture is showing you here. Because we're a forecast operation, working for the National Weather Service, right? So we're always there. A forecaster is always present because the sun can do something at any time and it can be just like that. Even unexpected things, believe it or not. So what you're seeing here in this picture is a forecaster sitting in there and you can see all the monitors. You saw that in one of the previous pictures, right? You saw some of these types of images and graphs and charts. And we monitor these things the whole time we're on shift. So when you're at home on Christmas Eve night, sleeping, waiting for Christmas morning, there's a forecaster in that office. On 4th of July, when you're having a great picnic with your friends and family, somebody's in that forecast office. That's the way it works. We're always there 24 hours, seven days a week, analyzing the sun, watching it closely, trying to predict what it's going to do. Because the bottom line is, remember, we're out to protect livelihood. And so we issue watches for when something is likely. We issue warnings for when something is imminent or really expected. And we issue alerts for when it's actually happening. Just like a regular forecast office does you to try to alert you about a coming tornado, for instance. You've seen weather maps, right? From a regular we uh, terrestrial weather, as we call it. You probably see this on TV with the TV weather people, right? You're familiar with some of these words low pressure, high pressure, warm front, cold front. I bet you all know what that stuff is and you're used to seeing it on a map. Well, we do the same thing, but you're just not used to seeing it this way. We do our own weather maps, but they're of the sun. We analyze the sun's different layers that we can see. So basically starting from that photosphere that where light escapes, a couple layers out from the sun, because we can't see deeper into the sun than that photosphere. That's kind of the limit of our knowledge, really. So we analyze and we conduct our own maps and our own analysis. Now think of your mom chopping up an onion. We talked about wavelengths and temperatures. Well, by doing that, we kind of get a slice of the sun and we can look at these layers uh, from the photosphere on up. And that's what you're seeing here in this image, some of these different layers based off temperature and wavelength. We can look at it magnetically. And I'm gonna use that word a lot because that's very important. In the end, my goal is for you to actually be able to make a forecast. You're going to predict two things. So if you keep listening closely, we're going to build up to that point. So we do all of our analysis and forecast to work up towards what the effects might be here at Earth, because that's the bottom line, is that protection of livelihood. So space weather affects our way of life. This image here is an illustration of a sampling of some of the things that space weather can impact. I'm going to talk about three main ones because we issue watches and warnings and or alerts for these three main things and they're all effects remember we're looking for that protection of lives and livelihood so the first thing i want to talk about is radio blackout briefly radio communication very important for our way of life now we communicate on all sorts of different wavelengths but there is a little band of radio wavelengths that's communicated on that is very important, and that's affected by space weather. Airline industry uses it. When they're communicating, they're flying across the oceans, they communicate by this radio band. Search and rescue people trying to save people's lives, they use this radio band. Emergency responders trying to rush to the scene to help people out, they use it. The military uses it. It's a very important and very big band, a uh, small band, but used widely by a lot of people. When you have a certain type of space weather event happen on the sun, we can send up a radio wave on this wavelength and it bounces off our far upper atmosphere and it can go down and you can communicate from, from one location to somebody else in another location. And this can even be done across parts of the globe. Well, certain events from the sun prevent that from happening. They no longer bounce because they instantly energize Remember, eight minutes, speed of light. So when we see this type of space weather event that I'm gonna talk about to you later happen, we know that atmosphere has already been heated up extensively and radio communication won't happen on that band of, of radio waves. So that picture in the bottom right down there, you see that big red bullseye? If you know your geography, you might be able to make out that that's North America and the entire polar regions. There was a certain type of event on the sun, which blocked out the ability to communicate on that radio band. So instead of reflecting anymore, it just becomes absorbed. 
They can't get through. That's very important. And that becomes a big issue for, uh, especially in times of crisis, when people need to be able to communicate on that band or for the airline pilots. Another thing that's impacting, now here's a fancy word for you, geomagnetic storm. So we talked about radio blackouts. That's what that first one was. Here's a geomagnetic storm. Now this is important for a variety of reasons, but the main one being electric power. You all like going over and flicking on the lights in your house, right? You know, fire up your computer and knowing there's not going to be a problem. Imagine if that was gone. Imagine if you couldn't go up in your refrigerator. Now you've all experienced short periods of time, right? From a storm, a thunderstorm or a winter storm where you get a blackout of power and you have no electricity coming to your house. But it's short. It's over a small area. You see that top right picture? That's a nighttime picture of the United States. So that's what the United States looks like at night. We have lights going all over our country, all these towns and cities. That big black chunk that I have circled there that's gone, looks like somebody took a bite out of the United States. That's from a massive power outage. Now that one was not space weather related, but it covered many states. As a matter of fact, Nicole told me she experienced that. So it's not. So the geomagnetic storms that happen that can knock power out. See that picture in the bottom left? I know there was a couple of, um, of you from Quebec. Well, Quebec lost power for 6 million people for over half a day about 30 years ago because of a space weather storm. It affects the ability for power to flow normally. That's because certain space weather events spin up the natural electrical currents which flow around our planet. And that likes to find shortcuts. You know what those shortcuts are? You know electricity likes to travel across wires, right? Power lines, telephone lines, pipelines, railroad lines, they'll find the shortcut and they'll scoot across it. So that eventually ends up on what we call the power grid. And when it gets overloaded, you see that bottom right picture? That's, that's a portion of a, what we call a transformer that the power grid uses to send electricity safely across a huge section of, of a country. That should be a nice yellow color, yeah, yellow or bronze. You see that black charcoal? That's because that transformer burned up and became inoperative. That wasn't the only one, but that's what happened with that storm in Canada over 30 years ago. We don't want that to happen today. So not only does the United States have an operation like us here at SWPSI to let the power grids know when something might happen so they can take precautions if possible, but the whole world is interested in this now because they don't want a long-term power edge. And this wouldn't be for a few hours. This could potentially be for days or even weeks without power. Imagine that long, that would not be fun. The third thing and the final thing I'm gonna talk about even though there's more is the radiation storm. Radiation, I know you all know that word, and that is not something that we want to experience, right? If a regular forecast office on, or the forecaster on TV told you, well, the National Weather Service has issued a radiation advisory for the following towns, and your town in one of them, do you think you're gonna be going out that door? No, you won't. But fortunately, we, we do issue radiation alerts, but they don't impact you whatsoever. As long as we're on the surface of the earth, you can't be impacted. However, as you go on in your uh, education and careers, if you decide to be a pilot or some kind of air crew, radiation storms will be of interest to you because you're flying way high in the atmosphere, especially if you're doing high flying stuff or up near the polar regions where you can get exposed to this a little bit at high altitudes. If you get into the satellite business, that can be impactful to a satellite. If Certain radiation storms hit the satellite in just the right way at the right time, although it's very rare, it can render the satellite completely useless because of malfunctions. A rocket launch, if you go work for SpaceX or NASA to launch rockets, they will stop a rocket launch because of a radiation storm or the potential that we're forecasting because they do not want a catastrophic failure while this rocket ship is launching into space. Remember, it's going to high altitudes and to space, right? where it's gonna be exposed to radiation storms. Don't want that to happen. And of course the astronauts, their lives depend on knowing what's going on with these, these storms when they happen. We talk to NASA every day. 
at least once a day. Because remember, there's the International Space Station orbiting Earth up there, and there's astronauts always on there. And we're letting them know what the potential for these storms are because we're trying to protect their lives. They may have a spacewalk scheduled. They may have to stop it because of a certain type of space weather storm to include a radiation storm. We're going back to the moon. They will be exposed. They will be outside of the protection of our atmosphere. But fortunately for you, you're on the ground. You're safe from a radiation storm. Or for that matter, most of these things, they would really just impact your way of life. But a radiation storm can't hurt you. That's because we have quite the protection system here at Earth. These giant space weather storms, when they happen, you already, already know our atmosphere protects us from certain types of stuff from the sun, right? I think most of you all know that. But there's a second thing that keeps you protected from solar storms. You guys know what that is? I'm curious to find out. Do you think it's the moon blocking things from the sun? Do you think the ocean and lakes, uh, the hydrosphere as we call it, attracts this stuff and it keeps it from you? The Earth's magnetism protects you? Or solid land just kind of keeps you grounded and just goes in there and it's, uh, the ground absorbs it? What do you think? Seem to have lost Nicole. Sorry, I apologize, I was muted. Um, we seem to be evenly divided between B and C right now. Riley and Luke and Mason, Ellie, I'll think it's B, the magnetosphere. And then we have a, a number of people who think it's C, the hydrosphere. Um, and we have a D and an A, but I think most everybody thinks it's either B or C. All right, good on you, awesome, good. Good uh, selections there, but the right answer is actually that magnet of the Earth, what we call the magnetosphere. It's a protective shield. You've all probably played with a shield, right? It's a lot of fun, right? It keeps you protected. Well, that's what it does from the sun. This is a magnetic shield that protects you from these radiation storms from the sun, from ever getting through. They can't get through. They have to go around. Now, they can get through into the far north and south pole regions, but they still, that's where the atmosphere comes in. Then the atmosphere keeps you safe and they can't reach the ground. So that's really awesome. We're really fortunate to have this protective magnet in our atmosphere that keeps us all safe from space weather. All right, we've talked more about the sun and space weather. We've talked about our protection layers. We've talked a lot about effects because that's the important part of this business. Here's a good chance for you to ask me some more questions. All right, good. Sean, I love this picture. Um, it's kind of a funny picture of a cannon. So I have a few questions that have come in while you were talking. Um, so Lindsay would love to know how many people work on space weather at NOAA? There is not that many. This is a new business, relatively speaking. There's a lot of people in meteorology business these days because a lot of science is known. There's a lot of things that help us predict it. Space weather is still a growing business and we're trying to understand it. Right here at Swipsy, we have about, well, short of 100 people. And really, across the country, for the United States anyway, there's not many more than that. The Air Force, I mentioned I was in the Air Force and did space weather there. They have a contingent very similar to ours that focuses on what we're forecasting and then they tailor it down to the needs of the military because they are the ones that support the military for space weather. So it's a similar operation with a similar number of people. And then there's a, maybe a few things that we're unaware of, private industry that has some business uh, in it and does some um, specific type forecasts perhaps, but very small. Like I said, at Swipsy, total in the weather service, there's short of a hundred people where there's thousands uh, or close to a thousand throughout the weather service doing regular meteorology. Great, that's, that's not a lot of people, so it's pretty specialized. Very specialized. Um, what kind of education do you need to work at SWIPC? Steph and Riss would like to know. All right, great. So physical science. Right now, the way it's set up, uh, you're hired here at SWIPC as a physical scientist. So you'd be wanting education that has something to do with a lot of physical sciences. That's where I was doing mine. I originally went to school to be an environmental scientist. But while I was there, I really saw my finding myself more interested in geology and geography and meteorology, hydrology, these things. 
So I started changing my course before I went on and joined the Air Force. And of course, while I was in the Air Force, I continued to do school work and eventually accumulated enough, um, well enough college credits involved in physical sciences to qualify me for the minimal education requirements. Generally, if you go straight to school and you want to get hired here at SWPSI, for instance, you pretty much need a minimum of a bachelor's degree in uh, some kind of uh, physical sciences, whether it's meteorology or space science. Um, the higher, the better. But if you've got that combination of education and experience, like that long round way I took to get here of over 20 plus years of work, uh, that's an option too. <laughs> okay, well that, so that should help you with your question, Sloan, because she just asked about that. Um, so Nolan, let me see, where did Nolan, yeah, Nolan wants to know, is there wind in space? Yes, we call it the solar wind. Very excellent uh, thing to point out because that's not something I was really going to talk about today. So here's that chance. So there's always this particles coming from the sun. I should do it from my window here. Particles always coming from the sun, swarming around Earth. So our magnetosphere protects us. They generally don't come swarming in through uh, our uh, magnetosphere or atmosphere. They generally go around it. Uh, but that's always there. And it's fast. Okay, but you have to think about atoms for a minute. So the chairs you're all sitting on, like I am right now, composed of atoms, right? And it's a solid object that you can sit on because there's billions and billions of atoms that compose it. They're all close together. Well, space doesn't work that way. There's not this blistering of atomic particles always coming from the sun. It's very what we call rarefied, meaning they're very sparse. They're so separated and spread apart that you can't create a solid object. So we can feel the wind, you know, a nice, even a light wind we feel, right? But the stronger that wind, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, you really feel that force. The winds in space, this is what's going to throw you off. The solar wind is blowing on a, on a small wind, a, a weak wind, about 300 to 350 kilometers per second. So that's roughly uh, 100, we'll call, it, we'll call it 200, 250 miles an hour. Fast, right? But you can't feel that if you're an astronaut in space. They don't blow away when they're doing a spacewalk because it's too rarefied. There's not enough atoms blowing through space. So they don't feel that pressure from the atoms. So even though it's blowing very fast, and when you get certain solar storms from the sun, that speed can increase to close to a well, well over a thousand miles an hour. Same thing would happen. You wouldn't feel it. I've been told that if you could be a baby, uh, that you could feel a baby's breath kind of blow lightly on your hand, that might be the extent of the uh, solar wind, even in a strong solar wind. Wow, that's interesting. Um, okay, I do have a couple more questions, but I think I want to be mindful of time, so I'll hold those for your next break, because I know you have another one coming up. Okay, great. So I'm going to take a question to you. All right. You all know the Earth rotates, right? Every 24 hours, doo -doo -doo -doo, we end up back to the same point where we were, right? Well, the sun's rotating too. A lot of people don't know this. I'm curious to know if you know it. And furthermore, how long does it take to make a full rotation? 24 hours for the earth? What do you think? A week, a half a month, or nearly a month for the sun to make a full rotation? Okay, Sean, I think you're gonna be impressed. Um, you know, we seem to be getting a lot of A's. Riley and Kyle, Maria, Luke, um, all think it's A, as does Nolan and Bridget, uh, James and Jason, Rebecca. Wow, A is definitely the consensus. Wow, outstanding, everybody. Very, very good. It takes 27 days on average for the sun to rotate. Now, I say on average because the sun is a ball of burning gas. It's not a solid object, and the equator of the sun is rotating faster than the polar regions of the sun. Ten days faster. Imagine what would happen if the North Pole rotated slower than the equator here on Earth. We'd have earthquakes, we'd break apart, we couldn't survive as a planet. But the sun can because it's a big ball of burning gas. But the funny thing about the sun is the magnetic field of the sun gets dragged by that differential rotation. So the magnetic field gets pulled at the equator and starts to bend, as you can see in this picture. Because it's going faster, the pole's going much slower. That happens month after month, rotation after rotation, year after year, that eventually you go from what 
theoretically should be a nice, neat magnetic field to one that's really twisted up. And if you've ever, if you have a pet or a cat, or, a, or you perhaps have ever gotten that a ball of yarn that was nice and new from the store, and you try to recover it and get it back together, it's a mess, right? That's what happens to the sun. It starts to turn into a mess. Now this picture here is trying to show the magnetic field of the sun. That's what all these lines are. They're connecting opposite polarities. So you've played with a magnet, right? And I'm not gonna take answers on this. I just want you to think. So if you take a negative and a positive polarity of a magnet and you put them together, what happens? Can you get them together? They attract, right? You can, but a positive and a positive, you can't do it, can you? They, they repel because they're alike, they're the same charge. So we're mapping these positive and negative polarities in the sun because they tell us a lot about what the sun's gonna do. So these magnetic fields in the sun, that differential rotation we talked about, that's happening throughout the sun's layers as well as on that photospheric surface and the other surfaces individually. And if you ever take a rubber band and you twist it and you twist it and you twist it, eventually you get these kinks, right? these little knots that form. Well, the same thing happens inside the sun with the magnetic field. These little knots pop out of the surface. Do they form and they come out and they reveal themselves like you see in this picture as localized strong magnetic fields. Now, we can't see those because they're invisible, those magnetic field lines. This computer simulation here is trying to map those field lines and show you where they might be going, but we really don't know. And they're invisible, but they do reveal themselves on that photosphere of the sun. We call these sunspots. So this image is a rotation of the sun over about one month, and we're looking at sunspots. You can see how they're forming, dissipating, moving around. Look closely at some of these clusters of sunspots. We call those groups. You can see ones shifting and pulling together, maybe moving apart. That's the magnetic fields of the sun all twisting and connecting and moving around and, and becoming a royal mess like that knot I showed you in the rubber band. That's what the sun does month after month, year after year. You get to this point, we call it the solar cycle, where every 11 years you have a bunch of sunspots like you got to see in this picture to a point where there would be no sunspots in the sun. Guess what? That's where we're at right now, solar minimum. There's no sunspots in the sun. The field is equalized, but over the next year or two, we're going to start to see sunspots. In about five or six years, we're going to be at that solar max that happens every 11 years, and we're going to have all sorts of space weather activity going on. But it can get us at any time. Just three days ago, we got hit by a what we call a minor solar storm from the sun, a minor geomagnetic storm that we weren't expecting. Something happened on the sun. We didn't see it or capture it in any of our imagery, and we had enough that we... Uh, ended up getting the warning out because we saw the indicators, but we never saw anything visually. This is really still tough business. So if you look at a sunspot group up close, remember 108 Earths can fit across the center of the sun. They can become quite big as you see in this picture here. That's the size of Earth compared to a sunspot group. Now that black dark area, that's where strong magnetic fields are either coming out of the sun or plowing back into the sun. So just think that there's all these little lines connecting these negative and positive polarities throughout this entire sunspot group. It's a magnetic mess, right? That's what can cause some solar storms to happen. So another question for you. You've seen sunspots, you know they're because of magnetic fields that become localized and they reveal themselves, but what do you think their temperature is? Somebody asked the question earlier about the temperature of the sun. I said the surface is roughly 6,000 degrees. Sunspots are a different temperature. Do you think there are burn marks and hotter blemishes from the magnetic field and still the same temperature or cooler because they're plug-like features? What do you think? Okay, so we are getting Riley and Kyle and James all think it's C. Um, lots of C's. Um, who else? Let's see, Jason thinks it's A. Nolan thinks it's B. Um, a lot more C's coming in. We're, we don't have much of a consensus here, Sean. <laughs> All right, good deal. I always like it when there's no consensus. Scientists love it when there's consensus, right? But I like to figure things out, so that's fun. Well, they're cooler, much cooler, in fact. They're roughly 1,000 to 1,500 degrees cooler because they're a magnetic plug. Think about that radiative energy coming up from the nuclear furnace of the sun. 
a strong localized magnetic field it has to kind of go around it so you can get these heated more intense fields around sunspot groups even intermingled among them and even higher in the layers of the sun but that sunspot group itself is significantly cooler another question for you so sunspot groups you saw a picture of one close up you saw a lot of them on the sun on that uh, animation what do you think would be the most likely one now sunspot groups are a, a solar storm location source for us we look at those immediately and we analyze them closely what do you think you think longer larger spot groups are more likely to cause a, a space weather event more sunspots means more chances or the fact that they're magnetically mixed groups uh, would be the thing to look for what do you think okay so i gotta make sure i'm separating my answers here from the last response um aurora thinks it's c um let's see juan thinks c as well uh so does ryan uh, ben says B. Um, Taylor thinks it could be B or C. Can't make up his mind. Uh, and James says A. So I think I think we've got a lack of consensus again, Sean. <laughs> well, you know what? This time you're all basically right. We look for all of these things. They could all mean a better chance for a space weather storm source. But really, it's the magnetically mixed groups that are really the attention grabbers. They are more likely to be a storm source for us. So if you look at that image, you can see on the right there that this is a colorized image of a magnetic field. Okay, so the blue and green represents positive polarity. The reds and yellows represent negative polarity. You see how tight together they are, how close they are. And if you look really close, you can see some mixed uh, magnet, uh, magnetic fields in there, right? Mixed polarities. This looks a lot like a weather radar picture, doesn't it? Well, we look for a lot of the same things. We're looking for shear and signs of a more storm potential, just like a radar tells us. That's why I put the colorized image up for you. So the more mixed they are, uh, the better chances they more than likely have to produce a significant space weather event. There's a reason for this. We talked about differential rotation, right? Now we talked about magnetic fields and how twisted they become rotation after rotation and they nod up and they come up through the surface and reveal themselves as a sunspot group, a strong magnetic field. So I know you've all played with a rubber band, right? I'll show you here against my shirt. It's fun. You want to take a shot at your friend over here, hit your sister or brother, right? But what happens if you start to stretch this a little too far? Am I kind of endangering myself here? yeah i am right because we know that if we overstress this rubber band what happens it's going to break it's going to snap and it's going to smack me in the face more than likely and i'm going to be hurt and we're not going to like it the joke on the friend ended up being a joke on you well that's what happens with these magnetic fields they become so twisted and stressed out like this picture shows you here you see those little arches that's solar material in magnetic fields so you can actually see them in this particular image on the perimeter of the sun and they become twisted they more or less break but we don't call it break because magnetic fields don't do that they do what we call reconnect they try to stabilize themselves so they get stressed and they snap and they instantly reconnect and reform in a less stressful situation but that releases enormous amounts of energy energy out towards space energy back down to the surface of the sun and that's what we're going to talk about here next after i take some more questions is what that means what are these cool space weather storms i'd save the best for last and that's what you're going to forecast oh okay so we're about to do our forecast that's i think that's good because we're at 45 minutes um so we had a, a sloan and luke and taylor a few folks wanted to know how often does space weather affect the earth so how often do we get these? Um, they can happen anytime, any place, but more frequently, the strongest, most uh, severe and extreme events are likely to happen around solar maximum. So every 11 years. So there's probably about a four year window roughly around solar max that we can have the stronger space weather events, uh, the really intense ones. And that's because that's the magnetic field has become so stressed out. It's built up a lot of potential energy with all that differential rotation. But that's our most likely chances for the big space weather events. Okay. Um, 
I don't know if you know this, but I'm, I'm going to try since I don't know much about magnetospheres. Luke wants to know, does Mars have the same magnetosphere to keep people safe? I'm not sure about Mars because I don't have the astronomy expertise anymore. I do know some of the planets. I don't remember. I know Jupiter has one. Saturn has one. A lot of the gas giants have a magnetic field. I'm not sure about Mars. If it does have one, it's very, very weak. But I don't know the answer to that. Um, so that could involve some more research. Okay, Luke, you can go find out for us um, and, and let us know. Um, and I think Aurora wanted to know what is at the center of the sun. I think you've, you've kind of talked about this in some of your explanations, but maybe you want to respond to that. Sure. The center of the sun is this nuclear furnace and it's burning hydrogen. So it's almost an infinite supply because the sun is so massive, but it's not. It has a lifespan. Uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head what that lifespan is, but it's, it's still got at least another uh, five million uh, or so years left in a minimum. But that's burning all this, it's fission going on. So atoms are connecting down in and releasing enormous amounts of energy. And that's what ends up transiting itself out through the other layers of the sun, working itself through all this mass and gravity and revealing itself into the photosphere out onto the higher um, layers of the sun. So it's really this nuclear furnace burning at enormous temperatures, releasing all this energy, which takes millions and millions of years, by the way, to work out from the center of the sun because it's so massive and all that gravity tries to keep it in there. So I mentioned earlier how eight minutes it takes for light when it finally escapes from the sun. Well, I said finally escapes because it can take millions of years for a photon of light created from that nuclear fission furnace to work its way out to that photosphere and then finally escape into space. That's really cool. Good question, Aurora. Um, and then Ryan asks, is it dangerous with that that magnetic mess just gets worse? Or does it like reset at the 11 year cycle? It does, it resets. So I can't explain it. This is another thing science is still trying to understand, but these sunspot groups, these magnetic fields that reveal themselves as a solar cycle begins. So we're just kind of starting our new solar cycle and we number these. So we're gonna be going into number 25. Sunspots start to form in the northern and southern latitudes further away from the equator. The more we get towards solar maximum, the more those sunspot groups start to show up closer to the equator. Now that's magnetic energy kind of working its way down. So each time these sunspot groups form, these strong localized energy fields, and then they slowly dissipate, they kind of absorb back into the sun over time and they shift and they work their way kind of back to the polar regions to restart. So as the solar maximum continues year after year and the fields start to weaken and less of these show up, eventually the magnetic field of the sun turns around. So unlike Earth, which stays pretty steady and it takes millions of years for it to shift around on the sun, Every 11 years, roughly, that magnetic field switches around because it's reset and it starts from scratch. That's very cool. One final one before we do our forecast. Um, and may, there might be a few other kids that are confused about this too. Um, are the sunspots, they look like holes in the sun, but you talked about that there are these colder uh, pockets. So can you maybe describe the sunspots again so that the kids understand that? Sure, so it's a really an optical illusion kind of. You're seeing visually a cooler area on the sun, so it looks incredibly dark, but it's really just an illusion. If you were able to take a sunspot group somehow and fling it out into space, it'd still be exceedingly bright, like brighter than a full moon perhaps. It just doesn't look that way because it's surrounded by all this bright light. But what it's doing, this magnetic plug, so to speak, is it's suppressing the ability for heat to come up, and that's why it goes around it. Now, it's actually, because it's cooler, you guys know, know do you know that cooler air sinks? Same kind of thing happens here. It's a cooler area, so it sinks a little bit. So it's not a black hole looking inside the sun. You're only seeing a few miles further down into the sun if you could actually look into a sunspot group. But it is kind of a little magnetic well at the same time. You are seeing a little bit deeper, which is another reason. Uh, it's not a reason it looks dark because that's the stuff going around. It. But if you ever see it on the side of the sun, sometimes you can see a little dip in there. And that's why. So it's kind of similar to a well, uh, but you're not seeing deeper into the sun because that's uh, a lot of energy coming up out of there. But it is 
like a little dip in the sun because it's a cooler area. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. We're good for now if you want to continue. All right. Great. Okay. So the space weather storms that we talked about. That reconnection of energy creates this thing called the solar flare. And these are enormous bursts of light that we can see through specialized telescopes or satellites in space. That inset of that picture there, if you look at that little dot on there, that's the Earth to scale of these things. They can be enormously huge. And they happen pretty fast. So I'll see if I can play this. It's like a giant bolt of lightning from the sun, right? It's that was a huge release. That's one of the largest flares we've had in some time right there. So they are uh, something to really behold. Another solar storm we have is this thing called eruptions. We call them mass ejections. So you have the solar flare. That correlates to radio blackouts, by the way. And then you have these mass ejections. This one I'm showing you, this image here. This is a prominence filament eruption from the sun. These are clouds of gas kind of trapped by a magnetic field. So when the magnetic field breaks, all this energy can, like the rubber band breaking, can snap out and explode out into space. Now in that animation, you can see a lot of flaring happening around the perimeter of the sun, around the, where that ejection took place. These are things that we're looking for in space weather, looking for these solstices, these solar flares, trying to predict what the likelihood is that happen. Look at these prominences and filaments, these clouds of gas suspended in a magnetic field to see their potential to explode. This is what they look like when you look at them from another telescope in space. That white circle in there, that's the diameter of the sun. That black disc around it, that's an occulting disc, we call it. It blocks the bright light so we can see a little further out into the outermost layer of the sun. This is that same type of thing, a filament eruption. That's what this looks like when you look at that outer layer. That's massive, right? That's billions and billions of tons of solar material flinging out into space, like me shooting that rubber band and letting it go. That's also dragging another magnetic field with it. And between that strong magnetic field coming from the sun, all that solar material eventually making it to Earth at some point, if it's coming towards Earth, that all interacts with our magnetosphere, our atmosphere, and creates a lot of these impacts that we talked about earlier. Sometimes they're directed towards Earth. That's what it looks like when it's directed towards Earth. Now, we don't always know, believe it or not, whether that's coming towards Earth or heading away from Earth, because it'd be going either or direction. That's why we analyze all these things, because whatever's happening on Earth side of the sun could be happening on the opposite side of the sun as well, because the sun rotates, right? All these sunspots could very well exist on the other side. We just don't see them. So we have to be very careful. We just can't assume that that was coming towards Earth. This is where you're going to start to do some stuff. But before we do it, I got another question for you. What do we call these? There's lights that happen in the night sky. From some of these interactions that we talked about, they can be quite spectacular. Do you guys know what this is called? We call them the Northern Lights here in the Northern Hemisphere, but there's a scientific name. Do you guys know what that is? Oh, this is a pretty smart crew, Sean. They all think it's C with just really. All right. Yeah. Great. We won't even mess around because I know somebody's name was Aurora out there. Good for you. That's right. We call it the Aurora Borealis. And this is what it can look like. If you ever had the chance to see it, hopefully one day you will. Some of you have are in these northern latitudes. You've probably seen them. And they're really cool, interesting things that are going on. All right. Time to be the space weather forecaster I've been promised you. See that empty chair sitting in our forecast office? You're going to sit in there right now. So if you've been paying attention, I'm hoping you guys will all get these right. All right. All right. Which of these two sunspot groups do you think is most likely to produce a flare? That top one, 2674, because it's longer, wider spread, there's a magnetic field that's clearly separated between positive and negative. Or do you think it's that bottom one, 73, that's more compact, less lengthy, and has a mixed magnetic field? What do you guys say? Oh, wow. So far, everybody is saying 2673. Kyle and Diana and Ellie and Sloan and Bridget and Seth and Riss and Luke and Taylor. Oh, we've got a few dissenters. Brid I'm sorry, Bridget and Jason think it might be uh, 74, but consensus is the bottom. All right, excellent. Well, we've done a great job together then because most of you have caught on to this. And even those that you didn't, 
we talked about there's still potential there, but the greatest potential is from that mixed up magnetic field of 73. And that produced this solar flare that you're seeing right here. It was the largest one we've had this entire solar cycle and one of the top 10 solar flares we've ever recorded. That was an incredible jolt of energy that thing produced. It produced quite the geomagnetic storm here at Earth, by the way, as well, a few days later. So here's my second and last question for you. And then whatever I have time left, you can ask me some final questions. Ready? Okay. You're in that chair. You've seen a solar flare. You have some imagery coming in some hours later, and we can see that there's a mass ejection happening from the sun. However, it kind of looks like maybe it's going away kind of from the perimeter of the sun there. So we do our analysis. I can't explain this model to you, but it's one of them we use to help us figure out whether an ejection is coming towards Earth or going to miss us. And the result on here is that it shows mostly a miss. It shows what we call a glancing blow, meaning the flank of it, the edge of it, might clip Earth. So we have, we have to decide. We've already decided to put out a warning. What kind of warning do you think we should put out? Minor, moderate, or strong? What do you think? OK, so Kyle says moderate. Rebecca says moderate. Ellie says moderate. Kyle says strong. And then we've got a few folks that think minor. Luke and Sloan and Juan and Nolan, Mason. Yeah, so we're we're a little divided on this one, Sean. Hey, so are we in the forecast office. When this happened, I was part of this group and we're trying to figure out what was gonna happen here. And in the end, after doing multiple model runs and analysis, we all decided we were gonna get hit by a glancing blow, meaning a slight hit by this mass ejection from the sun. So we decided to put out, I think it was about a moderate warning we decided to put out. But you know what? It's a tough business. We don't have all the information. We don't know what's always going on 93 million miles away. And we got hit by one of the biggest geomagnetic storms we've had. So clearly this was more than a glancing blow. And that bar graph on the left, you see how they're going up to the number eight? Well, the top of our scale is just above a nine. We call it a nine Z and above. We got to the level just below that. So this hits severe levels of geomagnetic storming. That graph plot on the top right, Think of that as a seismometer measuring earthquakes, except that's measuring the magnetic field. You can see how it went from nice and neat to really smacking up and down, right? That was a heck of a jolt. It really pushed our magnetic field around, created this energy, created a strong geomagnetic storm, a severe geomagnetic storm, and away we went. So we don't always get it right. So if you're interested in science and you want a career where there's still a lot to learn about something we just don't understand, space weather might be just for you. And with that said, any time we have left, uh, Nicole wants to fire some final questions at us, please have at it. If you were there, you could join me in person outside of the glass and forecast office like this group of students got to do before things changed over time here. Uh, maybe one day you can come back and join me personally. Wow, that's great, Sean. Thank you so much. I feel like we're sitting in that little space right now. So um I, I we don't have much time left uh but there is just one or two questions that um you haven't addressed um robert would love to know what is your favorite part of your job i love analyzing sunspot groups i love looking really close and studying these magnetic fields in uh, and that's one of my strengths i think as a forecaster is helping try to predict when these solar flares might happen uh, a lot of other forecasters have more interest in and a better uh, job and are much better at solving what kind of geomagnetic storm we might get or if we're going to get a radiation storm but i love looking at all the imagery of the sun remember that solar eclipse i saw and uh, when i was 13 astronomy has always stuck with me i love looking at pictures of the sun and looking at and seeing these things happen and analyzing that's my favorite part so it sounds like you're kind of like a detective oh exactly right just like any uh, meteorologist colleague is in uh, regular weather, you're trying to solve a puzzle all the time, trying to solve that, is there gonna be a crime? In this case, that's what you're looking for. You're trying to predict whether there's gonna be a crime. Is there gonna be a storm? And that's a lot of fun too, and a big challenge. And it's, uh, you, this isn't a job you wanna take if you, if you don't ever wanna be wrong. You have to accept you're, sometimes you're not gonna be right. Okay, one final question, and maybe you, and I don't know if you have the answer, but Jason wants to know how many sunspots have you found 
over your career? Um, wow, over my career? Whew, that's a tough one. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds because I spent four years of my Air Force career at a solar observatory that the Air Force has. And every day, one of my jobs was to draw the sunspots and put them down a chart and send them to SWPC and to the Air Force so they could do their analysis and forecasting. So over that period of time, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of sunspots. And then now in the other jobs I've had over time analyzing them, I've seen plenty more. So I'm well into the thousands of sunspots. Now on the sun at one time, I've only seen um, maybe seven, eight uh, tops, probably around 12 sunspot groups at one time, but that's still a lot of sunspots. Wow, thank you so much, Sean. This was great. We unfortunately were out of time, but you really answered all the questions that the kids have. If anybody had some lingering thoughts about um, anything that Sean said, we encourage you to go do your own research and to check out um, the SWPSI website. You have some links on the webinar page that you can follow up that Sean's left for you there. Lots of cool resources that Noah has online. Um, we really want to thank you, Sean, for, for coming today. I was getting a lot of comments from participants how much they love the solar flare videos, the animations, and um, some really cool uh, stuff that we got to see today. So thank you. And just a reminder to all of our attendees on uh, Friday, uh, we have Abigail Archer coming to talk to us about river herring. So um, they're running up here on Cape Cod and we'd love to share that with you. So um, hope to see you then. And thank you so much for your time, Sean, it was awesome. My pleasure, Nicole, and to all of you that were here today. It's been a lot of fun, and that you all stay safe and be well. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.